Good morning, Resonate family. It's so good to be here. Let's stand up. Let's celebrate. Let's worship. Magnolia First, be seated for just a moment. Welcome to Resonate. Glad that you are here. We got a few things coming up real fast that I want you to be aware of. Number one, this Saturday is our Cars and Coffee. If you're not aware of what Cars and Coffee is, if you have a classic car, bring it up. If you have a car like mine, bring it up, park it somewhere else. 
and walk over and see all the classic cars. But uh, hey, bring a friend out and a neighbor out. It is a great way to introduce them to the church. It's a great way to connect with people in our community. So Cars and Coffee, this coming Saturday, uh, 8 a.m. Come and join us, you don't wanna miss it. And then also I wanna remind you, coming up September 11th, we are gonna have a baptism service. And, and be praying, if you have never been baptized, would you come and talk to us about what it means to be a Christ follower, what it means to be baptized. And we would love to have that discussion with you. And then we are gonna have a celebratory baptism service on September 11th. And then that evening, we're gonna have a resonate night of worship. In fact, we haven't had a resonate night of worship since we moved into this building. And so would you come and join us September 11th. Baptism service during the service, and then we will have a resonate night of worship. Wonderful time together. I want to invite our guests. We're glad that you're here today, we would hope that you would get connected with us. There's two ways that you can connect with Magnolia's First, and these are important because we want you to know all the things the church has to offer you, all the things that would help you know how you can belong here, how Magnolia's First can become home uh, for you. But two ways you can connect. Number one is our uh, Get Connected number, 281-343-3033. Text one of the keywords on the screen and you'll be in the right place or go straight to our website, m1bc.org. Hit the I'm New button and you will find all about it. But also for our guests and those of you who have joined recently, next Sunday we have a lunch for you. Uh, we have a thing about once a quarter called First Lunch. And so right after this service, next Sunday, if you've been visiting, you have questions about the church, come have lunch with us and learn all about the different things that we have to offer. All our pastors will be there and you'll, you'll be able to learn just a whole lot in, in one hour. And so again, and not to mention it's a free lunch. Come on. Can't beat that. And then that evening, if you have joined the church and you've never had an opportunity to go to our pastor and pastor wife's home, come and join us. We, uh, we will be that evening, just have a new member reception. It is a great time. We sit in their living room, another free meal. You can't beat that. And then, uh, but we just talk about what it means to be part of Magnolia's First. We learn everybody's story. It is a great time. So next week, first lunch next week, uh, new member reception. Come and join us. Would you stand up? Let me pray this morning and we'll continue with worship. Father, we love you. And Father, I pray that as, Father, many of us have just moved into a, a new season with the fall here, Father, with school back in session. And Father, would you just slow us down today, slow us down in this next hour, and may we just focus on you and worship you. Father, open our ears to the word you have for us. And Father, may our hearts just give gratitude and praise to you. And so Father, we love you in Jesus' name, amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the way From the throne of endless glory to a grave
the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father is born And the church of Christ was born There the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel to the world Shall not
about God's love is that it never fails, right? It never gives up on us. And we will go through all sorts of trials. We will go through all sorts of things in life, your journey, wherever you are, you've been through things, you're going to go through things. Maybe maybe you're in a, a great time of peace in your life. Maybe you're, you've drifted. And maybe singing, I need you, I love you, I want you, didn't feel real. But sometimes we just have to say it. We have to just speak it. Because we're lost and you can't find yourself the song defender says when I thought I'd lost me you knew where to find me we have to depend on Jesus we have to look to him and he is good he was always good his goodness never fails it never gives up on us so when we say I need you I want you I love you whether we're feeling it or not you have to release it to him 
and let him change your life and let his goodness wash over you because we know his promises are true. We know that he is good. We believe that. And we sing about his goodness. We sing about his love because we know it's true. So we're doing that now together. It's important to do it in your car, when you're listening to music, when you're worshiping, when you're reading God's word. It's also important to gather in this room, in his house with other believers to walk through life together and to sing, to sing about your Savior, to sing about your God. So my challenge for you is if you're not feeling that I need you, I love you, I want you, don't worry. God's got a plan for you. God knows where you are. And his goodness, it's after you, and you can't escape it. You can try, you can't escape it. He is good.
listen to God's goodness. thank you for the blood of Jesus. We have met the end of ourselves. We can't do it, but you can, and you made a way for us, and this is our story, the story of your redemption. Your goodness is so good that you were willing to leave everything for us, for me, and yet in my daily failures, your goodness still When I lose my way, you still come after me. Though I was in the crowd calling for your death, you still forgave me. Your goodness was greater than any evil in this world. So hear the praises of your people as we lift high who you are, the great I am. We worship you, Father. We worship you and you alone. You are the only God, the one true God, the living God, the enthroned Father on our praises. Amen. The 80-year-old retired professor emeritus had returned to the seminary at which he had spent so many years teaching classes on the Word of God and ministry. And he was a guest lecturer that day to the incoming class of young seminary students, men and women who were preparing for a life of vocational Christian service. And the subject of his lecture was temptation specifically temptation toward what older English translations of the Bible called lust that would lead to sexual sin. And he was telling those young men and women about the dangers of succumbing to such temptation and how to do so could destroy their marriages and destroy their ministries and do great damage to the people of God. And then he ended his lecture by giving them some practical biblical guidelines of how to protect themselves from falling into temptation and sin. And at the end of his lecture, there was a Q&A time, and a number of the young seminary students were asking questions, and one young seminarian raised his hand and said, Dr. So-and-so, can you tell me how old do you have to be until that's not a temptation anymore? And he looked at the young man, he said, well, son, all I can tell you is it's sometime after 80. <laughs> <laughs> and that humorous story, I don't know whether it's true or not, but that humorous story reminds us that temptation is an ever-present issue in the life of every Christ follower. It always has been since the earliest days of the Christian church. Temptation comes to everyone who seeks to follow Christ. What I love about the book of James is that it deals with this kind of issues. We're in the midst of a, a study, a, a lengthy study in the book of James, the New Testament letter written by the brother of Jesus to Jewish Christians who had been persecuted and scattered in the first century world. Uh, last week, James taught about 
trials, the inevitability and, and how to, to frame and understand the trials that come into your life. And today he talks about temptation. And it comes to all of us who follow Christ, rich or poor, young or old, to every language group and ethnicity around the world, to everyone who seeks to follow Christ, temptation will be a part of their life. It comes in many different forms. It comes in different shapes. And temptation can defeat the strong and oppress the weak. You think of examples from Scripture of those who were tempted and fell into sin because of temptation. Uh, Abraham, or certainly Samson, whose life was wrecked by temptation and sin. Uh, even David, who was called a man after God's own heart, fell into temptation and sin. And in the New Testament, there are examples. Judas, of course, who fell into the worst kind of temptation, and he betrayed Jesus and later took his own life in remorse. And then the apostle Peter, who when the heat was on, denied Jesus three times. And the apostle Paul, that great catalytic missionary of the early church, talked about the reality of the struggle against temptation in a very transparent moment in the book of Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 21, he talks about this tension within his own heart and life. Follow these verses on the screen. The apostle Paul said, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then glorious good news in verse 25. Paul says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, if you want to say amen sometime to let me know you're out there and awake, you're kind of in the dark, but that'll give me, it's like saying sick them to a dog, okay? So just every, every now and then. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Very good. Paul goes on. So you see how it is. Now, now picture this. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Someone said it this way, temptation is not a problem you solve, it's a tension you manage. And, and, and I would expand upon that and say, it is a battle you constantly fight. It is ever present. But let me make this statement to bring you some good news. Temptation is relentless, but it is not irresistible. Let me say that again. Temptation is relentless, but it is not irresistible. In today's passage, James is going to help us understand how temptation works and how to deal with it. So go with me to our main text. We are in James chapter 1, and we'll pick up our study in verse 13. James 1, 13. He says, and remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Now, I think we need to dig down a, a bit into to these words. First of all, notice he says, when you are being tempted. Like trials last week, it's not a matter of if you are tempted, but only when you are tempted. Temptation comes to everyone. But James wants us to know the source of that temptation and that it's not God. Then where does temptation come from? He continues, verse 14. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. 
Now, I'm going to pull out some meaning from that verse in a moment, but I want to frame this theologically for us with three statements to help us understand the dynamic that's at work here. The first of the statements is this. We are all born with a sinful nature, a sinful nature that naturally gravitates away from God and towards sin. We all know the story of Adam and Eve. We know about the apple. We, we know about the, the snake who tempted them. We know that they chose to go their own way instead of God's way. They, they sin. Our initial ancestors polluted the human race with sin. And that sin nature has been passed down from generation to generation to generation all the way to you and me. We each have a sinful nature. You have it and I have it. And the natural gravitational pull of that inner sin nature of all of us is towards sin and away from God. That's a reality. We all have sin natures. Statement number two, and this is for those who are Christ followers. When we put our faith in Christ, on that day that we stepped across the line of faith to trust in Christ, to believe in him, to give our heart and life to him, to commit to follow him. When we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit places within us a new nature. And this nature seeks after God and his righteousness. You see, alongside the sin nature, when we come to faith, the Bible says we're a new creation, and a part of being a new creation means we have then a new nature. The Holy Spirit births within our heart a new nature, a redeemed nature, a spiritual nature. And that nature's natural gravitational pull is toward God and toward his righteousness. And so we have two natures. We have a sin nature and we have a spiritual nature. And the third statement is really the rub of the whole matter. Those two natures are constantly at war within the heart of the Christ follower. That's exactly what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 7. Those two natures are constantly at war with one another. They are constantly doing battle. Have you, have you seen the old cartoons where, where it has, you know, the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other? Well, I hate the oversimplification and trivialization of a deep spiritual truth, but that really is the case of those two natures are constantly at war, both speaking to our hearts. Our old sinful nature and its sinful desires is always seeking to assert itself in order to gain dominance over our thoughts and our behavior. It's always after us. That is what temptation is. And so, James says, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. Now, interesting that in the Greek, <clears throat> the term translated here, entice us, is a fishing term. It's a fishing term. It literally means to bait, to bait, to put bait out there. It's an enticement. Now, understand the enticement itself is not sin. Have you ever heard someone say, it's not a sin to be tempted? That's actually true. It's not a sin to be tempted. We, we cannot help but be enticed. There may be something that's attractive to our sin nature, and we see that, but if we have not acted in sin, the temptation itself is not sin. Dave, would you hand me that water? <coughs> i got to get some lubrication because I'm just getting started. To bait is the term. Now, I'm, I'm not much of a fisherman, I will confess, but I can understand this imagery because understand about this, the Satan, Satan who is the fisherman who's trying to, to lure you in. First of all, he knows exactly when to drop the bait. <clears throat> he is not omniscient, but he is cunning and he is smart, and he knows just how to time it in your heart and in mine. 
He knows just when to drop the bait. Secondly, he knows what bait to use for you and for me. Your bait will be different than my bait. There will be different things that will entice you that would entice me and vice versa. Thirdly, he knows just how to sink the hook into us. There's a time in which the fish chomps down on that bait and the hook is embedded in its mouth or the fisherman snaps that, that rod and, and the hook goes into the mouth and then the fish is, is caught, it's, it's hooked. Satan knows how to do that with us and then he knows how to reel us in and do his destructive work in our lives. It's quite a word picture, verse 15. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Now, I want us to understand the process here. It says desires give birth to sinful actions. The sin occurs when the action takes place, when we act upon the enticement, the bait when we do that which is against the will of God. Uh, and so here's what I want you to understand. Usually when that happens, it is not that we are shaking our fist in God's face saying, God, I know you don't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's not usually that kind of thing. It's just we don't think about God in that moment. We just are, are, not, are not thinking about God. God. It's, it's not so much that we are in, in overt, angry rebellion against him. We are just not thinking about him. We're thinking about only what we want to do or we think will be pleasing. <clears throat> Some of you may recognize the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that's a, a funny name I know and you may never have heard it. Let me tell you who he was. He was a pastor in pre-Nazi Germany. He was one of a few that did not go along with Hitler and the Nazi regime. Most of the church in Germany in that day went along with Hitler in the pre-World War II days because they thought they were losing influence and power in Germany, and so they wanted to... to to hitch on to Hitler's wagon to regain power in the country. By the way, when the church gets in bed with politics, the offspring is always ugly. That would be an amen uh, place, just in case you're wondering. And, and that's what happened in Germany. The church of that day jumped on, to, except for a few pastors that resisted and called out Hitler for the evil man that he was. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of those, and he ended up being executed for his faith. Here's why I bring him up. Before he was executed for his faithfulness to God, he wrote one of the classic works on temptation. And I want to give you just a little bite of that great work. And it's, it's, it's a little bit long for a quote, but I want you to follow me because it's profound and insightful. It's going to be up on the screen. I don't know if you'll be able to read it, but listen as I quote him. Quote, In our members, speaking about when temptation is taking place, in our members there is a slumbering inclination towards desire which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. All at once, a secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. Now listen. It makes no difference if it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money or finally, that strange desire for beauty of the world, of nature. Joy in God in course, is in course of being extinguished in us, and we seek all of our joy in the creature. At this moment, joy in God is unreal to us. He loses all reality, and the only desire 
And the only reality is the reality of the devil. Satan, this last sentence is, is the most profound. Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. That's how temptation works. He doesn't try to turn you into the enemy of God. He just wants you to forget about God and do what your sinful nature is pleading with you to do. And when that happens, James says, sin gives birth to death. Now, he's not, not talking about physical death. He's not talking even about spiritual death. But we need to, to look at to whom James was writing. He was writing to Jews. And for the Jewish mind in the first century, death was not the final event. It was not necessarily the ultimate destination. When they spoke of life or death, they were speaking about a path of life, a direction of life. And you're either on the, the path of life that leads to God or the path of death that leads to eternity separated from God. They thought of it in, in the, the context of the journey. And what he's really saying here is that a person, even a Christ follower, who falls into sin because of temptation can look more like a person who's on the journey of death than the journey of life. Let me make it practical. Other than rejecting Jesus as Savior, a, a Christ follower can't do that because they've already accepted him as Lord. But other than that sin, a Christ follower can commit any sin a lost person can. They can be guilty of any sin that an unsaved person can. But the difference is in the heart a born-again Christ follower can fall into the same sin that a lost person, but they will never find joy there. They'll never find contentment there because it's against the spiritual nature that's a part of who they are. I heard this saying a long time ago. I think it's true. It stuck with me. A lost person will leap into sin and love it. A saved person will fall into sin and hate it, and hate it. James is saying, don't let temptation pull you into sin and steal your joy and steal your usefulness in the kingdom of God. Don't let the enemy hook you and reel you in. I'll take a quick detour to the words of the apostle Peter in 1 Peter Chapter 5, verses 8 and, 8 and 9. Here's how Peter warned the early believers about this. He said, stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember, that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Now again, James and Peter were writing to Christ followers in the first century who were going through scary and difficult times. But guess what, friends? So are we. So are we. And the same truth that they were trying to convey is desperately needed for us to put God's truth into focus and know how to live in its light. <clears throat> and so in verse 16, back in James 1, James says, so don't be misled. Don't be confused, my dear brothers and sisters. He's writing to those struggling, suffering Jewish Christians who have had to, to flee their homes and living in unfamiliar situations and circumstances throughout the Roman Empire. He says to them, who could have been so easily confused, don't be confused. Yes, God either sends or allows trials into your life to grow your faith. Yes, he does. But no, God never sends temptation. He is never the source. It is the enemy who is seeking after you. 
He's reminding them and he's reminding us that though we live in a fallen world where evil and suffering and injustice and dishonest and mean people are everywhere, even though we live in a world that is just filled with ugliness, our God is a good God. Our God is still in the midst of the the ugliness of a fallen world. Our God is still a good God. And so James reminds them in verse 17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. I love that line. Who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Our God is a great God. James says, who created all of the lights in the heavens. I was in conversation with one of our members this week. He had provided some medicine for me for a problem I was having with my eye. And I said, I appreciate it. It's much better. Looking forward to seeing you Sunday morning. And he texted me back and he said, well, I'll be there in spirit, but I'll be on a plane to North Dakota. And I thought, North Dakota? And he said, I'm going there on business, but, and I don't know if you saw the story on the news, but it, it, they're saying it may be possible in North Dakota to see the northern lights. And he said, I'm asking God, since I have to work on Sunday, can I see the northern lights? <laughs> Pastor Seth and Rainey went to Iceland on vacation, which sounded kind of strange to me till they described the nor- northern lights. And my point for sharing all that is this, the God who created all of the beauty that we see even in this fallen world, he's a good God. And he's at work. And he gives us good and perfect gifts. Verse 17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. What a, he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Now here's why that's important. So much in this life, follow me, so much in this life is unstable. It's changing. It's uncertain. You can't depend on it. Whether it's the economy or it's the the, the nations of the world at war with one another or who's in office somewhere, whatever it might be. So much of this life is uncertain and unstable, but our God never changes. He is certain. He is stable. He is unchanging. He is the solid rock into which we can anchor our lives. And this great God, don't lose me here, this great God, verse, six, verse 18, he chose to give birth to us. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And by the way, the, the word translated word there is the same word that's in John chapter 1, verse 1. We quote it at Christmas all the time. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. You you remember that? You know who that refers to? Jesus Christ. And James says, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true Word, his Son. Now, look at this. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Now, two two things from that verse I don't want you to miss. Number one, our redemption was not something that we investigated and we discovered and we found a path to get to God. No, our redemption, our reconciliation to a holy God was because not because we chose him, but because he chose us. He chose us. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He chose to give birth to us. And then he says, not only that, out of all creation, we became his prized possession. He chose us to be the crowning glory 
of all of his creation. I love the way the Apostle Paul says it in Ephesians 2.10. You know this verse. For we are God's what? Masterpiece. Say it aloud. Masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. James in our passage is saying, don't deface the painting of your life. Don't deface God's masterpiece that he is seeking to bring to life on the canvas of your life. Don't fall into temptation and sin and thwart all the good that God wants to do. Because my friend, if you're a Christ follower, God is at work in you to use you to reveal Jesus to the world. That's what he's about. Now I want to close the message with three simple challenges. If I tell you about temptation and don't tell you what to do, I would be irresponsible. So quickly, these three challenges. Number one, here's what you do. Focus your mind on good and godly things. That's where it starts. Focus your mind on good and godly things. Here's what the Apostle Paul said at the end of his letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Listen, we can fill our minds with all of the junk that's going on around us. You can just look at the news and see how messed up this world is. You can just see all of the evil that's going on and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, the economy's in the toilet, but God's on the throne. You can fill your mind with all of the negative stuff, and it will eat away at your faith like a cancer. Paul is saying, don't do that. Focus your mind on good and godly things. Think about the goodness of God. Don't just sing about it on Sunday. Think about things that are good and godly. Secondly, fill your heart with the truth of God's word. Fill your heart with the truth of God's word. Look at Psalm 119, beginning with verse 9. The psalmist asked, How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. I've tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Your word. I heard this old saying a long time ago. Dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. Dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. You know, we have more access to scripture and biblical teaching than any generation in human history, don't we? I mean, it's at our fingertips. It's in our phones. We, we can find it so easily. But let me ask you a question, personal question, okay? Are you in the word of God every day? Are you in God's word every day? And, and maybe you're thinking, well, pastor, not every day. Well, do you brush your teeth every day? Do you eat every day? Do you sleep every night? We do those things because they are essential to our physical health. Well, being in God's word every day is essential to our spiritual health. 
and I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. As a shepherd of this flock, I'm trying to protect you. The enemy is after you. And the Word of God is our, is our shield and our sword. Because here's the reality. Malnourished Christians are easy targets for the enemy. Biblically malnourished Christians are the low-hanging fruit for the enemy. We need to be strong in the Word of God. Be in the Word every day. Because if not, you're just waiting for him to hook you and reel you in. So I encourage you, fill your heart with the truth of God's word. Here's the last one, then I'm done. Flee from temptation before it hooks you. Flee from temptation before it hooks you. James 4, verses 7 and 8 from the voice translation says this. So submit yourself to the one true God and fight against the devil and his schemes. And then I love this last sentence. If you do this, he will run away in failure. <laughs> he will run away in failure. Here's what I'm challenging you to do. Identify your greatest areas of temptation. Yours are going to be different from mine. I know what mine are. Identify your greatest areas of temptation. Take practical action and look how to build firewalls of protection in your life against them. And then when he gets past those firewalls, be ready for the attack. Do you remember what Jesus did when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan? Hmm? What did he say to Satan? The word of God. He quoted scripture. You need to identify, listen, you need to identify those scriptures that speak to your particular area of temptation, those most common areas of weakness in your life. Identify what they are, find the scriptures that speak to them, and when Satan comes trying to hook you in that area of your life, quote the word of God to him. It will encourage your heart, and he will run away in failure. Flee temptation when you can, battle it when you must. I leave you with this one final scripture, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. The psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. We are all dealing with this spiritual dynamic in our lives. James was not just writing to those Jewish believers so long ago. He was writing to us. Because temptation is real. Our weaknesses are real. Our vulnerabilities are real. Those areas in which the enemy would, would drop the hook that has been skillfully baited with that which entices us to sin is real. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so we claim the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be able to submit our hearts, our minds, and our lives to you so that we will not succumb to temptation, but we will stand strong in the truth of God's word. Help us to be yielded to you. Help us to be filled with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be rich in the truth of God's word. Father, in these next few moments, I pray for those who came to this service with deep hurts and struggles. I pray that they would take advantage of this opportunity to pray 
with our prayer partners who will be here at the front. I pray, Lord, that, that praying with someone would strengthen their heart and give them comfort. And then I pray for those who are here today who need to take a step in their faith journey, either that first step to become a Christ follower or a step of recommitment and repentance to you. Father, help them to come as well and to say to one of our prayer partners, I need to take the next step. And Lord, if they'll do that, we'll show them how and we'll give them support as they do so. Father, for those who are here and need God's healing power, help them to come and Lord, I would be honored to anoint them with, with oil that you teach us as a symbol for your healing mercy. Help them to come so that I might anoint them and Cindy and I might pray for their healing. Whatever you intend to do in these next few moments, we pray that your will would be done. Would you stand in the spirit of prayer and reverence as our prayer partners make their way to the front? There'll also be prayer partners in the balcony. If you need to pray with someone about a, a burden on your heart, this is your opportunity to do that. If you need to take a step in your faith journey, this is the opportunity to do that. Let us give these next moments to the Lord.
strong my brothers and sisters in the power of the Lord resist the enemy and he will flee from you and live a life that reveals Jesus to the world God bless you have a wonderful Sunday Thank you for indulging me, Noah and Bob and the rest of the band. <laughs>